45 minutes. So, Pasha, instead of you being a policeman, let us external circumstances be policemen. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> so, what I'm going to talk about right now. Um, you see, when I sent the topics of today's talk, I thought that I, that I would like to start with uh, making the tropical curve counting uh, the star topic. But, uh, but when I completed <coughs> the plan of this week, uh, I saw that uh, it would not be that impressive uh, before you understand the structures that are behind. Because this A model counting seems to be a solution to some problems. And the first, you need to understand these problems. So it's one reason. <clears throat> Another reason was uh, my uh, discussion with Dom, okay? When I realized that idea of tensor product is not clear to people and the people are missing it. And that's another reason why I'd like to change the order in which I'm going to explain things, okay? So, <clears throat> so I'll continue the idea of B model. So it will be B model and algebraic structures. Associated with. And of course, uh, <coughs> this would uh, invoke uh, moduli spaces and, and all that. So, <coughs> in order to explain this, I will do the following. First, I'll revisit which is the theory. And TT star as the prototype. And then I'll discuss integrable systems. Well, first I'll discuss tensor product. And go to integrable systems. So, uh, so I hope to cover these two topics today, because uh, of course, we will study this QGSITO theory and tensor product in order to apply to topological string theory. And there, and there will be the point number three that I would like to mention. And this point number three would be called higher residue pa pairing. And you see, it's interesting, but I have another reason to discuss higher residue pairing. Not only because uh, it was needed. You see, we will see two reasons to study this. One reason was obvious. One reason was to go from associated, uh, oriented, oriented solution to, uh, so, oriented, sorry, not solution, oriented, I'm sorry, oriented associativity equation. Equation to 
WDVV. So it was one reason. And <laughs> second reason, strange, but second reason is that technique used here seems to be applied in modern string theory. And I'll call it ambitwister strings. So So it turns out that it's impossible to understand ambitwister strings so you, you, uh, without higher than you parent. It's interesting. I do not know the deep reason why it happens, but uh, things are the same. Calculations are the same. So, so that's why I decided finally, finally this night, I decided to rearrange things in this order, okay? So, <clears throat> so I'll uh, explain Kyoji Saito theory not from his original motivations, but from the structures that he had. So, oh, QG cite a theory. As W, let us call it super potential. As an input. But it, has, it, but it also has an interesting output. Output of Kyoto Science. The theory is flat connection with spectral param parameter. On. So now is flat. on the modular space of the formation of W. So first I'll try to explain <coughs> how to get this output from input. But uh, I would like to do it in the generalized setting. Namely, let me take as an input a sum manifold X. Complex and I will stress non compact in general. With super potential. So, this generalized setting does what? It uh, generalizes two examples, the example of Kyoji Saito from singularity theory and the uh, example that we discussed last time, Kalabiyao manifolds. 
and uh, let me put a name on the board. And uh, the name of the person who studied such systems in 92 is Igor Krichevier. So Igor Krichevier studied this example. He had a Riemann surface, set of punctures, and he has superpotential here. Okay. So there are another people studied this input. And uh, these people are actually, I think, Italian mathematicians. So unfortunately, okay, so there are many of them. Uh, who studied the geometry of supersymmetric quantum mechanics. So W is yeah. supposed to live on the surface. W? Yes. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, is it supposed to have some varieties of punctures? Ah. Once again, so when you see it, so surface and the puncture is a geometrical notion, okay? Yes. So these punctures here just mean that it is kind of divisor that we just cut out sure. of the surface. When you see this surface and punctures, you have in mind that it is pretty similar to picture that, that is the string world sheet, right? Uh -huh. But it is not because W should live on the target. This is a target. Yes. So it is a target X. So actually, one, what one has to study here, of course, not only complex one-dimensional X, but multi-dimensional X. Mm -hmm. But uh, this is uh, more complicated. Nobody studies this. Igor Kinchevier, he is a great expert in the degradable system. And uh, he loved to study Riemann surfaces and the punctures there. Mm -hmm. So it is his data. Mm -hmm. So, so we did a mathematician study geometry of n equals two, so-called Landau or I will say supersymmetric, supersymmetric quantum mechanics. Now, Kyoji Saita. Never heard about these works, okay? So, uh, as I told you, <coughs> this setting was very unnatural uh, when you study B models uh, uh, that you make out of twisting. So different people knew pieces of uh, the full story, but uh, they have not put them together. And everybody could claim that they had almost everything in their papers. And uh, this uh, uh, work of Italian mathematical uh, ge geometers was used then by Chikotti and Waffa, Titi Star equation. I I'm explaining you the place of the subject. At the same time, Pasha, as you may see, <coughs> this picture is also natural, not only as a target picture, but also as a world sheet picture, okay? When do we, where do we see the Riemann surfaces with punctures on it? Of course, when we are discussing so-called string amplitudes. Interestingly, it is not a coincidence because what people are doing in so-called ambitwister strings, they use it as a structure of the world ship. Okay? So that's why I'd like to spend uh, some time explaining this. And how, how do we get these models? 
For the first thing, how do we get these models? And there was a second thing that is more interesting for people who are doing gambit twister string. It is called <coughs> localization. Okay, so this is kind of, a, of an advertisement why you should study these models. From this, you get integrable system. <clears throat> this model is interesting in many reasons. For many reasons, you see, it's just to ask why you should study this is just the question why you should study CP1. You know, CP1 has a lot of structures in it from the world sheet, from the targets, from different fields of different uh, things. This is a similar system. And I would like to stress the unknown works of Igor Krechevier, who is known, but these works uh, are kind of unknown. Okay? So the time of these works is something like 92, 93. Okay, but they are on the internet. Okay, so the best way to study this would be <coughs> to start with the n equals two supersymmetric quantum mechanics in this setting. Okay. that I'll be out of focus. So, so there is something that people uh, studied when people studied supersymmetric theories. Excuse me. So what they know? They know that they typically have a target space X then people know that uh, <coughs> in order to have a theory with such target space, if you want to have n equals two supersymmetry, you could write it, you could write the Lagrangian as a sum of the following terms. So I'll write it in terms of supersymmetric theory. I will not uh, use it. I'll just uh, explain how people call it. So people, so it's actually an action. No, it's a little Lagrangian because I, because later I'll integrate it over dx4. So that's how people wrote in the 70s in physics, general n equals two supersymmetric theory in, uh, so it works like this in, in dimension one or two. So mostly people prefer to work in dimension two. So it is, uh, sorry, I hear some, some sound, maybe it's a question. So people studied it, this structure, in dimension one, two, or four. Okay? So we would be interested in uh, dimensions one and two. However, people, with application to physics, started it with dimension four. So what what are the objects there? So what, what is what is phi phi bar? What is k? Mm -hmm. So phi 
phi was a superfield. So superfield uh, was a function on the <coughs> far of uh, world shift variables and also theta's. And uh, phi bar and this x was something like x plus theta gamma theta bar. So it depended on uh, this combined x. You, you may call it chiral completion or something like this. Uh, these are actually functions. Okay, x plus theta gamma theta bar and theta. So why people came to such to such strange functions? Okay, well let me let me remind you why people did it. Did it's because people studied the action of the supergroup. So they said that there was a supergroup. And if you have supergroup, you have generations like translations and supersymmetries. You also had rotations, but they are not important at the moment. And you had to represent it. So, so it was the algebra. So maybe I, maybe you are right, Pasha. Since people are using this terminology constantly, I need to explain a bit. So this is a super algebra, okay? <clears throat> then how do you represent Super algebra. How do you uh, how do you represent algebra? It's good to represent it as a space of uh, fields on some manifold. Okay. So what what could be the best manifold where the algebra uh, uh, acts? The best manifold would be the group manifold itself. It is very simple algebra. It, it is almost abelian. It is interesting that nobody paid attention to this algebra before of supersymmetry. So in this Lie algebra, you have only one non-trivial commutator. Almost abelian. It is nil potent. After you commute Q, then uh, the result commutes with everything. So it's the simplest possible case that you can even imagine. So another algebra that is that simple is a Heisenberg algebra. So it is kind of an analog of Heisenberg algebra. Very simple. Nothing to be afraid of. Then, <clears throat> then imagine that you have this structure. You would like to represent this algebra in terms of functions. So you can you consider the supergroup very easy. You can take exponential map. Wait, wait a second. There are also rotations which don't commute with, with, with yes, translation. But, but, but for some reason, I'm not going to to take it into account. There so, would be rotations. So it's it's a non-abelian algebra which contains a nilpotent piece in it. Uh, yes. So uh, you see. When people started to, to do this, they started uh, with, with including rotations because it was important. However, uh, in what I'm going to say, rotations should be considered as an external symmetry. Mm -hmm. Okay? So I'm actually going to represent this algebra. And rotations would be external symmetry. So, First representation that you can have would be the functions on the. Oh right, so this is a this is a subalgebra inside the the bigger one containing the rotation. Yes, yes, it, it, it's a subalgebra, and I can represent this, and then I can then I can consider the rest of generators 
as external symmetry. So I can consider functions on the supergroup. Actually, I have a remark of history. So this algebra was uh, actually first in the five. In which year? Uh, of uh, uh, 55. Oh, interesting. Yes. So who discovered it? A uh, Chinese mathematician, uh, Miss Professor Zhang, who was uh, who is a student of Fogg. Ah. He studied repetition of uh, Pangrai group. Sam. Sam. Yes. Uh, we are we are restoring the. We would like to restore. Uh, okay. The priority. Please uh, send us. Please send me the link. Okay. Sure. 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 Mm -hmm. <laughs> 55, great. Because you see this, you see actually this is enough. Uh, here we have the structure constants that are just uh, equivalent with respect to the action of rotation. So, we, so it is that simple. Moreover, in what would follow, we would study the case D equals one. Later on, we will study the case D equals one well, there is no rotation. So, uh, so this would be pretty enough. But, and of course, Sam, thank you. <laughs> we need to restore the priority. Okay, so now we have this uh, supergroup and uh, we can consider functions. I'll call it G super, just supergroup. So they would form representations. However, it is possible to reduce representation. Okay? Because otherwise, as people say, you have too many, too many fields. Representation space is too big. So <clears throat> there is a way to reduce representations. And, uh, and it goes as follows. You may consider left invariant, left invariant uh, functions. Okay, so uh, since it's a supergroup, you you would like to put put some coordinates on it. So when you study bosonic groups, it's not easy to put coordinates because uh, there is a huge problem of ordering. However, here you can very easily put coordinates. So, so you just study something like this. So this is the supergroup. So the only thing you need to worry about is how to order these guys. So here we have the question of ordering. Now, <clears throat> now there are so-called left invariant. Functions. And they would form a representation. So left invariant functions sorry. So left invariant functions So how do I write them? I will write left invariant operators. I'll call them D left. You see maybe it's good that we that I started that I started to answer these questions because uh, 
After all, it's a supersymmetry that that is also in the problem. So these are left and variant operators. So you may ask left and variant operators in which coordinates? So, this is, so these are some kind, kind of wild coordinates. It's, it's easier for me to write, uh, so there is a way to order these exponents such, such that this would be left and variant. And, uh, So actually here I put theta bar. And I also have right invariant. Minus theta bar or theta bar B gamma M B alpha D over DXM. You see, I am <laughs> it's interesting. I am switching from the original plan. But maybe this is a proper way, to, proper place to switch, because we will use it later. So well, let us switch to this left and right invariant differential operators. So, so the only difference is the sign. Yes, and as you know, uh, I always miss signs. Okay, but this is a sign that you should not miss. This is important sign. So, uh, so let us. So, so we have these operators. We have also operators d over the d theta bar, alpha bar, minus or plus, here is plus gamma theta d over the extent. So these these are also d left. Sorry, I put left upstairs with a bar. People put here this crazy dot. Okay. So it is like complex conjugated index. Then, then we can Im immediately check two things. First, how do these operators commute? They do form representation of the algebra. It is one line computation. You commute this. And this, and you actually form representation of the algebra. Because derivative of over theta, if theta here, like derivative over theta bar, hits theta bar here. And of course, you have the result of computation. Okay. Now, what can we say about D right? D right forms the same algebra. And now, what can we say about commutation between left and right? Here we have this tricky change of sign. They do commute. So it's great. D left and D right. Can you? By the way, Pasha, let me thank you for your questions. Because maybe the earlier I introduce all this stuff, the better it will be, it will be later. When we will come to, come to super strings, when we will come to uh, super young males, yes? Right, so, yeah. Maybe so it's, it's, uh, thank you for explaining this. Um, yeah. I, I'm asking out of ignorance. Yes. So, 
And you see, this is, so you may not uh, think how we are ordering exponents. These are exactly the properties that you expect from the left and right uh, derivatives. And also this works in all dimensions, okay? Now, so now I'll explain terminology of physicists. Ah, yes. Because normal mathematician is surprised when he hears terminology of physicists here. He saw that the, all the chiral, anti-chiral, D terms, F terms, you see, it, it's the kind of a argo, okay? And I'll try to explain that there was nothing to be afraid of. So th this is understandable, yes? Okay. If this is understandable, let us find representations. And, and there are several representations. Okay, I'll explain all of them. Okay, good. Good. Representations. So there is so called. <coughs> Vector representation. It is just uh, functions of x. You see, we have x because we need to represent shifts. Okay. Thetas and theta bars. Nothing great about it. What is interesting is that there are other representations, so-called left invariant. So we consider the equations that physicists used to call constraint, you see? When you hear this word constraint, you say, you think that you are not understanding what they are doing, you see? It's not constraints. They consider left invariant uh, functions. Ah, so I'll promise that later I'll explain you another word that physicists are using, so-called twisted, okay? People sometimes use the word twisted superpotential. It, uh, this kills mathematicians. So left invariant, and similarly there are right invariant. And later on, later on, I will not go to explain this, there is the so-called twisted. I'll explain it later, I promise, okay? So this twisted representation is somehow used in one of the approaches to mirror symmetry. But okay, maybe it's a, maybe it's a place, where, and it's a time where I have to explain it. But you see, this twist, as far as I understand, happened only in d equals one and two. So I, I'll come back to twisted later. So let us start with something that are left invariant and right invariant. These representations work in d equals one, two, and four. And uh, you know, you know what? People are interested in d equals four because we happen to live there. That's why they ignore this twist representations for a moment and work only with these representations, okay?
Now, I don't know where to put this twisted. So you see how far it is from Kyoji side, okay? Who is algebraic geometer? So they don't want to hear about all this stuff. Okay, left, right invariant. Now, <clears throat> how to solve this equation? You see, I know and we know that mathematicians are great mostly for writing equations and not for solving them. We write this equation, we write that equation, and then we study the property of solution without solving. So it is, so we know. However, this equation could be easily solved. Huh? So how to solve this equation? Ah, so let us, you see, to see that it's easy to solve this, we will ask Pasha to solve this, yes? Okay. How would you how would you try to solve this equation? An exponent. And 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 I'll put the another thing. Theta bar theta, gamma d over dx. How to solve this equation? So, it is, so actually, it's a partial differential equation, right? Mm -hmm. It is nonlinear. It's interesting. Because we have seen it here. But still, yeah, it's it very is, simple. It's solved by plane waves, like appropriate plane waves. So it's by Fourier transform of, or whatever. Ah, no, you see, Fourier transform. Uh, would not work because here we have this theta. You are uh, uh, plane waves are great if you have uh, linear differential equations because then you take differential into algebraic, and this is nonlinear. Let me stress you where it's nonlinear. And, and let, let, let me tell you something. Let me tell you, tell you something. Uh, still, there is a way to solve this equation. Ah, we, well, let us do it in the following way. Let, let me write you the, the baby example of this equation so that you can solve it. And let us all solve it. So what makes things confusing is this gamma, the indices, all this, OK? So let us solve the simpler version of this equation. OK, now we will solve the equation, you see. So let us solve this equation. I will put here gamma as a number. It's a number. Just to keep trace that we have it. So how to solve this equation? Like a holomorphic dependent on. You see, you see, we cannot solve it as a holomorphic because you see here we have theta bar. So, but idea of uh, Sam is the following. <coughs> So how do we solve equation in general? So how, so how, are, how are we solving this type of equations? We are looking for invariant functions. OK? So in holomorphic case, the proposal of sense would be in an even case. Of course, you know how to solve it. You find a solution, and then you know that any function of this solution 
is also a solution, right? So that's what we call holomorphic. So idea here is to do the same thing. Let us find some solution. And then the function of the solution would also be a solution. According to Sam's idea, So once again, so first we find F naught such that LV on F naught is zero. Second, what we do there? Any function on of F naught is a solution. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because LV of F of F naught equals to F prime of F naught and V of F naught. So basically, this is the sense proposal how to solve this equation. So, of course, uh, this is known in the theory of differential equations, but uh, let us apply, apply the theory. So here we have simplest case. Let us try to find solution to this equation. We need to find some solution. In the case of complex structures that Sam proposed as a, as a baby example, we know that Z, that is X plus I Y, is a solution, right? So that's what you propose. If we took here Z, we will have one here minus one here with a solution. That's how we get to holomorphic functions. Here, the, here this story is a bit trickier. Because we have theta bar here. Asha. Yes. So if you cannot solve this equation like this, let me give you a hint. No, but I understand you wrote the solution like several blackboards ago. I understand. Yes, but then, then, then let me give you a hint that all physicists know. This is differential equation linear in these coefficients. Okay? Mm -hmm. So where, where did we have it before in mathematical physics? It's harmonic oscillator equation. Remember, there was an annihilation operator that was d over dx plus omega x. Okay? I think we remember this. So the theory of harmonic oscillator, we had similar structure. And of course, we know how to solve equations for harmonic oscillator. We remember that this is solved by e to the minus omega x squared. So did I got it correctly? Maybe omega squared, no. So maybe there is two somewhere, but it's not important to. So you differentiate, you take from quadratic piece something linear, and you compensate it by, by linear. So we know it. It is in the course of on quantum mechanics. So in order to solve this equation, you just need to do what people do, what people do, did in harmonic oscillator theory, look the quadratic, look at the quadratic ansatz, okay?
So another thing that I would propose to do is okay. So so idea is the solution to this equation is so la, 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 let us see is x plus theta gamma theta bar. And we will call it X with the head. Is it a solution? It's or not. You may try to think why it's so. So uh, up to the, up to the order of bars and and bars in on theta. Yes. Yeah, so so the order of bars is not that important. Uh, we would like to say that this side here corresponds to the side here. So yeah. let, let us check. Let us check. When we differentiate with respect to theta, we get gamma theta bar. When we differentiate with respect to x, we again have gamma theta bar. Mm -hmm. So we have this solution. So these are the left invariant, these are the left invariant something. So, so we have so-called chiral representation. So forget the word chiral. So physicists these days in the uh, early 70s were just obsessed with the idea of chirality, of fermions and all that. That's, what, that's why they called everything chiral. So don't be afraid. So this is a solution. So this is the left invariant function. You know, it's great that it's possible to write it in such an explicit form. Maybe it will be instructive to find it in a regular way. So regular way to, to solve it. I'm, so let us know how to solve the general thing. A I J bar A I J. Okay, so how to solve this equation? So this equation is uh, ah, you see, sorry, it's not just an oscillator. Here I have d over dx. Okay, so but it's interesting to see how to solve uh, such equations. Okay, maybe it's not a good time to go into detail on how to solve this equation. This is the solution. Okay? But this equation has another solution. It's called theta bar. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, there is a notion of chiral field. With a function of x bar and theta bar. And, and, and such fields, such field is called chiral. However, let us see, we solved only d over this theta equation. There was another equation, d over d theta bar minus theta gamma d over dx. What about this?
So you see, things are similar. So previously, we canceled the uh, uh, derivative of theta. And here we need to cancel derivative of the theta bar. Yes? So we're not supposed to solve these two equations simultaneously. Why not? We are. We are, but are there any solutions? I mean, our all the x hat, I think there's a wrong sign there. So uh, now let us check. Uh, you are right. <clears throat> we are not uh, so 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 we so we cannot solve. You are right. You are right. So we cannot solve them simultaneously because in this case the anti commutator would be non zero. So we solve only these equations. And we are so, so, uh, so, so we impose this condition, but there is, uh, there is some other condition that, that, that we may impose here. And this condition is, so what is the operator in theta that commutes with this operator? Of course, so this is operator d over d theta. So this to commute. So solution to this set of equations. So solution to this, so let us see. So we have this set of uh, equations, right? So do, so do they commute or not? Uh, they do. They do. So, uh, but to, but uh, but actually, I want to take here only solution of uh, of x. Okay. So in any case, uh, <clears throat> so if I so if I consider this, it would work. Mm -hmm. So so these things are called constraints, mm -hmm. and then and then what I need to do, I need to write down. Lagrangians. So one Lagrangian. So 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 uh, and and I call this and and I call this and I call this field chiral field. Okay. So simultaneously, I have an anti chiral field. So uh, people people used to people used to write it in the following way. So they have this x bar and the uh, theta bar. Mm -hmm. 
So, 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 let, so let us see how supersymmetry is acting here. So, so my mom, sometimes people call it anti chiral So maybe I confused the, maybe I confused, I, I confused the notation. So people prefer to write it this way. So, uh, so this is a standard definition. So once again, we have this X, that is X plus theta gamma theta bar. So if you, if you have a minus here, maybe it's better to put theta bar here. And uh, there is also theta. So people call chiral fields functions of X bar and theta. Mm -hmm. So uh, so they solve this. So they they solve these conditions. Now. <coughs> Now uh, it was now it is possible to write so-called anti-chiral fields. So uh, so uh, here we put theta bar dependence, and you put another x. Because you annihilate uh, with the constraints uh, d over d theta minus theta bar gamma d over dx. So this is a for chiral, so called for, for chiral, and this is for anti chiral. So I, I need to put in the notations. Let me put here plus and let me put here minus. So these uh, so this form representations of the super algebra of these functions because You may act on it by all generators of the supersymmetry. By left invariance, by right invariance, by anything. So it is the only tricky thing that people have. So this version of superfuse, they have no relation whatsoever to a KZ type of superfields. Of course, not relation. It There's is like a different, different amount of thetas. Has, Sorry? It has nothing to do with the KZ. Yeah. Mm. So there's no way to understand well, 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 this as, as differential forms. Hmm? Yes, you see, you are right. So first of all, these thetas are different from these axes. They have nothing to do in common. Moreover, these X's have this and very particular structure. And the, there's also a relation between them here, but here the relation is quadratic and in the case there it's, it's, it's linear. So oh, you mean because, because there was nothing here? Yes. In a, in a case that they're related by the RAM, which is kind of one-to-one -one between X and theta. And here it's somehow quadratic. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, now, so, so, so these are fields, and then, uh, and then, using these fields, you must, uh, you may start writing down uh, uh, Lagrangians. So. 
So let me first comment on the notations. So when you have this field phi, you typically decompose it. So it is first function of this plus it's theta i alpha f alpha of this plus theta alpha theta beta and people call this f so you may ask why i am stopping here at the moment why i have only two and the answer is the time consider a so-called n equals two supersymmetry. So, uh, so it is n equals two supersymmetry in dimension d equals one and two, but it is n equals one supersymmetry in dimension four. And people, uh, so people, well, when people started doing this. They started with the n equals one counting. So people actually wanted to study the four dimensional series. That's why they, they that's why they did it in dimension four. And in dimension four, as you know, the left spinner <coughs> has two components, right? And that's why they said, ah, oh, here we stop at the second level. Do it only like this. So they found that this superfield contains of what? Scalar. And this is spinner. And then this thing. So this thing is uh, is a scalar again, as far as I understand. So how do I know that there are scalars? It's because, remember, I have this rotation as an external group. So I have nothing to rotate here. Here I'm rotating theta, it's a spinner. And here I have uh, anti-symmetric product of two spinners. That is obviously a scalar, right? So <clears throat> here I explained the appearance of spinner fields. And also I explained you this term. That stands in front of two theta's, and that is a scalar. Now, what I'd like to do, I'd like to write down supersymmetric Lagrangians. Uh, and they, I think if you wanted to time yourself by by send whose departure or arrival, I think that probably happened uh, sort of inconspicuously. Ah, yes. So 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 let me make a five minutes break. Okay. Pablo, can you can you hear me? Hey. Hey, hey, how are you? How are you? Ah, ah, ah. No, you're <laughs> doing doing fine, doing fine. It, uh, sorry, I had a question about this. So Andre just left. Yes, yes, so, so I'm here. I'm oh, here. Andre, how are you? Hi. Yes. Hi. Um 
So we were trying to find the representation of this super um, Lie algebra, right? Yes. So did we find the representation? Yeah, yes, even even two or well, three, I guess. Uh, it, so it was, maybe I'm uh, slow, but so now we found some functions that are annihilated, right? And yes, uh, but that was the construction of representation because we wanted to cut out from some large representation, which was mm -hmm. all functions on the, on the on the super algebra. We mm -hmm. wanted to find the smaller one, and the smaller one to, was given by imposing what Andre called constraints, and a constraint was to allow to ask for two operators to vanish in the functions. Yes, and, and I even made the mistake, okay? So now I know that people need, so, so would you ask the, the full left, left invariant functions to, uh, to go away? It would be too much, you see? So I made the mistake in my explanation. So first I actually wanted three differential operators to, so all left invariant, no, no, not all left invariant. So a, it is kind of a, a cart, uh, how to call it, uh, yes. Yes, left, yes, uh, left invariant with respect to this, uh, to this field. Mm -hmm. So it is like a G over H construction. Like, uh, mm -hmm. like just imagine that you have a group SU2 or SO3. You have a function of the three-dimensional sphere. They definitely form a representation. But you, <coughs> but you can also uh, look at the coset construction. So you want to uh, impose condition that uh, the subgroup H or subalgebra H x by zero, mm -hmm. and in this way you will find the representations of the S2. Am I right? It is also a representation. So uh, <coughs> SO3 acts on S2 and two-dimensional sphere, for sure. It acts from the left, you... Uh, it acts from the left and you annihilate from the right. So G from the left, X on G over H, where H is acting from the right, right? So maybe this would be. So SU2 over U1 is a CP1. Or S2. Mm -hmm. We know that functions on S2 represent the algebra of SU2. Why? It's because we are we are acting from the left. And we consider uh, functions that are invariant with the actions of U1 from the right. Okay? So U1 X from the right uh, and SU2 X from the left. That's how we get the, uh, uh, the smallest representation. Pasha, is it clear that? Uh, let me think. Um, uh, is it clear? And since left invariant fields and right invariant fields commute, I have a representation. Yeah. So I need to yeah. take functions on SU2 as a definitely form representation of SU2. Mm -hmm. It's called regular representation. Then I consider functions that are invariant with the action on the right. So <clears throat> left invariant vector fields are acting on this space since they commute with the action of U1. U1? Yes. So would I take here SU2? It would also be a representation, but real. Yes. 
So League of Mind is saying that I will, uh, I'd like to have a representation over the space of all, say, right invariant function. It will be too much. Because yeah. right invariant function of the group are constants, right? Yes, yes. But I can have fields that are invariant under the subgroup, exit mm -hmm. from the right. Yeah. So is it this? So 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 what uh, what uh, I described here is an analog of this construction. So proper way to say this would be the following: We have the space of functions. We have left invariant fields and right invariant fields. So left invariant fields form representation of the super algebra. And we and but we have the actions from the right. And we take a subalgebra, okay? Mm -hmm. That is uh, that is not big enough, okay? Okay. We don't take all all algebra from the right; otherwise, we will have constant. But we have subalgebra that is big enough, so. From now, let us see what is this subalgebra that acting from the right. It is exactly subalgebra of operators d over d theta minus gamma bar gamma d over dx. With the minus sign, it's clear that they are acting from the right. Would it be plus sign? It would mean that it's left. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Moreover, uh, so we have two of them in this case. So it's a subalgebra. It reduces representation, of course, but it also, what does it also do? It reduces the representation, but the representation is still big enough. Okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So like here, SU2 over SU2 from mm -hmm. the right. It's also a presentation if you make from SU2 from the left, but this representation is not big enough. Okay. So here we act by U1. And, and there is an analog of this construction because uh, there is also SUN, and you act here but S by SUN. I think minus one times U1. Something like this. Probably just u n minus one. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Same. Maybe so. Maybe like this. So this uh, this seems to be CPM. No, this seems to be a sphere. Not this, sphere. Is a, this is a sphere, yeah, yeah. Yes, but, but still, okay. But you see, here I don't know. Here the question is not if it's a sphere or not a sphere. It's a question how to write down representation. If mm -hmm. you put here S O N minus two, you will still get a representation. Yeah. But, but it will be bigger representation. Mm -hmm. And we want to get a smaller representation, okay? Mm -hmm. So, when when you're con when you're taking this constraint, you're saying that uh, the right derivatives act on the space of solutions of this constraint. Because yes, by can... the way, not all right. So it's important that not all right derivatives. In particular. If so, so what could be what could be right derivatives? This is a right derivative. And this is also a right derivative, right? Yes. So if I impose these two, I'll yes. have a consequence that is d over dx would be zero. Mm. 
it will be still it will be a representation, but not a representation that I'd like to have. Mm -hmm. Like in the example of uh, SU2 and U1, I don't want to have corpses. Yeah. So, so in this case, I exclude this. What is also important is that this subalgebra is invariant under the Lorentz. Okay. Mm -hmm. So people don't say invariant, it's equivariant under Lorentz. So mm -hmm. when you apply Lorentz symmetry here, mm -hmm. this is uh, subalgebra transforms into itself. So this mm -hmm. contraction is Lorentz equivariant. And that's why people were happy in the mention form. <clears throat> but, but you are adjoining to this, uh, this, this uh, other set of operators, D over D theta bar. Uh, so are they... Um, so do they also have a good property? What is the good property? Being left invariant vector fields? They, they don't, right? So sorry, well, once again, so when I, so, uh, so holomorphicity means that I, you see, I always forget where to put bar, but. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we agree that the representation is imposing these constraints plus some d over d, either theta or theta bars, to be zero. Yes, I think d over d theta bars. Mm -hmm. But these are not uh, whatever left invariant vector fields. Or uh, what's the what's the deal here? Uh, maybe 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 you are right. Maybe this I. Maybe maybe here I said it wrong. So so actually, what what is the meaning of this constraint? Maybe you are right, and the, and I did, did did this wrong. The meaning of this constraint is that dependence on the theta bar is governed by this. Mm -hmm. So solutions solutions yes solutions are functions of x hat and thetas yes. Sorry. Ah, okay, 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 good. Uh, you see, uh, I, I made it wrong, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. But you see... Uh -huh. Okay, good. I, I always say that when somebody can make a mistake and correct himself, he understands what's going on. If mm -hmm. somebody can say only right things, it probably means that he learned it by heart. Yes. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, so this thing, you see, I start to recall it. So this thing, uh, so this is kind of uh, homomorphicity. So the dependence on theta bar is like this. Mm -hmm. So, so would it be abelian algebra? Would gamma uh, would gamma be equal to zero? Okay. We might say that we just uh, eliminate theta bars, okay? Mm -hmm. Maybe this is another way to explain. It. So we have functions of x, theta, and theta bars. We want to impose constraints, or we want to reduce representation in a way that is invariant. So naive idea. So if gamma would be zero, yes, we may say what? We may say, let us forget theta bars, no theta bars, OK? Mm -hmm. uh, so, so it will be possible. And we need to put this constraint for both theta bars, because uh, there is a Lorentz rotation that rotates theta bars. Mm -hmm. Then you will get this. However, we need to impose such, uh, such trick in a way uh, so, so that we have a representation from the left. And D over the theta bar do, do, do not commute with the actions from the left. So we, instead of writing D over the theta bar equals to zero, we impose this constraint. <laughs> and actually, it's the only thing that is compatible with the Lorentz, so maybe that might be this way I'll continue 
Ok? And it's the only thing that is compatible with, with the Lorentz and D equal form. And people were doing this for like 10 years or for some period of time until people realized that if you reduce the Lorentz, then you will have another set of constraints that is that it's possible to improve. So, so D over the theta bar, maybe it's better to call them with the bar, since it's D over the theta bar, anti-holomorphicity. Mm -hmm. So in D equals four, you have these constraints. And these are chiral fields in D equal form that people, people are interested in. Let us see what happens later. In D equals two, you know, interesting thing happens. The Lorentz group becomes smaller. Okay? And when Lorentz group becomes smaller, it turns out that it's possible to impose another type of constraint, okay? Mm -hmm. So why in D equals four, we have to impose D bar over alpha bars only constraint? Because they are rotated by Lorentz. However, in D equals two, <coughs> The two-dimensional representation goes to what? It goes to one-dimensional representation. And we have another choice. And we will come to it later on. Okay, so now let, let me continue with the Lagrangian. <clears throat> So was n equal to built into the construction from the very beginning? Yes. So, <clears throat> so the n equals two. So we see when I call it n equals two, it is in the dimension d equal one and two country. However, this construction started as n equals one supersymmetry. So it's uh, only supersymmetry that you have in dimension four. Because people started to do this from dimension four. Because they assumed that we live in four dimensions. This was not a mathematical exercise. People started this to describe our world. So I so I had to solve I, I had to say this. So it is the only thing that you can have in dimension four, in dimension four. Mm -hmm. And then, if you reduce by dimensions, there, uh, there are other possibilities. But in dimension four, it's the only thing that you can have. So now, let us see how we can get something. So you see, to, together with these fields, that I'll call chiral fields, there are another fields that I'll call anti-chiral.
So these are chiral and these are anti-chiral. So these two form two different representations. And uh, you may see that there are two ways to write down uh, invariant Lagrangians. First way to write down invariant Lagrangian is the following. Let me first give you the simplest example and we will immediately generalize. First way. To take the D for phi of what? Of the superfield. And here as a superfield, I will take, so it is a toy example, and then we will generalize this one. Mm -hmm. So let us see what we will have. So people, people are very happy when they wrote this Lagrangian because it's very simple. However, in Lagrangian that we have in our physical world, we need kinetic terms, right? Nice. Because there are waves around, yes? Yeah. <laughs> there are evolution. And uh, this Lagrangian looks like... It, it, it's like a less term. See? And this Lagrangian looks as having no kinetic term. It's, it's like a mass term or something. Yeah, but it's, uh, it's, it's not a mass term. It's a tricky thing. Mm -hmm. So, because <clears throat> when you want to take for the derivative of theta, Mm -hmm. You might try to find how to get it. Mm -hmm. And uh, once again, so phi was phi with a head. Was phi of x plus plus what the, what the people used to call psi of x plus theta plus f. Theta, theta. Mm -hmm. So it, it from can... this term, mm -hmm. so what you get from this term? So it contains the mass term for f, right? Yes. So this term is called d term. So people call it d term because this field, phi bar phi, is not neither chiral nor anti-chiral. It's a general field. So for a general field, you can take d for theta. And of course, you get this f, f bar term. And mm -hmm. I, I can put here indices. Mm -hmm. The tricky thing here is that there is another way to get two thetas. Let us take I see the term from phi bar, so it'll be psi bar. Mm. And let us take derivative term from uh, the first phi. So if we decompose this phi of x of psi of x plus in terms of psi of x, we will get psi or theta times psi of x plus theta deep side theta theta bar okay mm -hmm. and we will pick up this term so from 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 phi bar we get this and from psi we get theta 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 bar deep psi. So that's how we can 
get these four heaters. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we get here the director, derivative mm -hmm. of the failure. Mm -hmm. Isn't it nice? It's very nice. But now let us see what we will get. So there is another way to get uh, four theaters. Ah, derivative of phi. Take derivative of phi. here, take derivative here, yes. Mm -hmm. So it is d phi bar, d phi. Once again, four theaters. So uh, everything works with given matrices, and you get interesting result. F F bar plus psi bar d psi. I put it like this. Plus d phi bar d phi d mu isn't it great? Mm -hmm. So this term that looked as a mass term mm -hmm. gives you kinetic term and also what you call mass for the F fields. So F fields turn out to be auxiliary. They have no kinetic term. They have all only mass term. They could be integrated out. And this is the theory of the chiral multiple. Now, there'll be even more fun. Pasha, are you ready for more fun? You say, I'm sure. sorry, but it's, I'm trying to be American. <laughs> are you ready for more fun? Sure. Why do you call this five bar five? We can take here a function of five by five, of five bar five, and I call this function k. Why should you call the function k if you have a function? Because only because you know the answer. If it's a killing form or what? Uh, no. Uh, okay, well, let us make a quiz. So, so look, you you are ex you expect to get a metric on the space of fields, and you call uh, the function that makes this metric k, whom do you want to quote? When the metric is made out of a function. Who, pro who proposed interesting uh, class of metric? K Keller, Keller. Yes, k for Keller, you know. So, so let us do this. So the simplest case, so let, let us look at this bosonic piece. But I mean, the, th the thing that we want here is uh, invariance, in, in right? Uh, under, under the action of our supergroup. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I take a field and I, and I look at the component with the fourth power of theta. Mm -hmm. This is called d term. Mm -hmm. Do you know why this is called d term? <clears throat> This is called D term simply because when you have a function of x theta and theta bar mm -hmm. and you don't know anything, how would you decompose it if you just discover it? You say it's A of x plus B, B of x uh, with theta, yes? Mm -hmm. Plus C of x. Oh, with, I see. Uh, theta very, bar very clever. Sorry? No, I'm saying this <laughs> very clever terminology. Uh -huh. So we see you just, uh, and you go to this uh, D. Mm. Actually, you want something Lawrence and Larry. So you have this. You have this. 
Once again, you are in dimension four. So you take a function, you need the Lorentz invariant something. This term, this term, and this term. That's why it's called D, because D is the fourth letter. So there are other terms, but they're not Lorentz invariant. Because, because later on you would like to integrate. So D term is a term that contains four theta, and it is D because it's the fourth in the sequence. There, it's not because of Dirac. It's because it's... So people just study these terms that are invariant. So, so terms that contains only one theta alpha, you can write it down, but uh, you will not get invariant regression. So this is the origin why it's called D term. Once again, it's like when Mandelstam introduced his variables in scattering processes, STU. Why STU? Why not uh, I, I uh, you know, it's better I, X, and some, some other, like people, like mathematicians. Because you just name them, S, T, U, because it's a sequence. A, B, C, D. That's why it's called D term. Mm -hmm. And after somebody started to call it D term, everybody calls this integral of a D for theta D term. Now, let us see. Modification, and the interesting modification would be here. So you have D, D over D phi I, D over D phi bar J, K. And these guys would have I and J bar. But are, are there some restrictions on K? For instance, can I take K that's dependent only on phi and not on phi bar? Uh, you'll get zero. Why? So for different reasons. Uh, because in order to make this term, you need both phi and phi bar. Because uh, if you take, uh, uh, otherwise the integral would be zero. If I take phi squared, don't, don't I get well, something? Because phi squared in some sense contains only thetas. Only what? Only thetas. You need to have both to balance the... Uh, but I, I have uh, theta bar and theta in, a, in X hat, right? Yes, but, uh, but, but, but you cannot balance that. Mm -hmm. All right. You cannot balance. You'll get the total derivative. Ah, okay. Or, uh, so it's, it's, there are many ways to, 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 to see it. But in, in this way, it would not work. Mm -hmm. You need to oppose. Let us put it uh, other ways. Uh, you, later on, you'll have the integral over x's, right? Mm -hmm. So you can deform the contour to go over x pluses, OK? Then you'll kill half of the thetas. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, what is great? The great is that we got the Keller term. What is what I'd also like to mention here is kind of subtlety. So after I say, after I say great result, we know that k is not globally defined. Of course, you remember why why this metric is a Keller metric. It's because. You see. I need to make several remarks. The complex structure 
skill comes natural because because one of the fields are chiral and other fields are anti-chiral. So you have very natural decomposition of fields into chiral and anti-chiral from the very beginning. Now subtlety. Subtle, subtle thing here is that K is not globally defined if you consider it as a sigma module. Mm -hmm. These are only local coordinates. So subtle thing here means that if you would, if you would like to see what is actually globally defined is not the integral of a d4 theta, but actually the integral of a d2 theta over, uh, if you put here covariant derivatives on k. So it's a subtle, subtle issue. You see, k is not globally defined mm -hmm. in general. Sure. This formula is globally defined. Because uh, it takes uh, derivatives of k. You may ask, would it be true for fermions? I would say yes, of course it would be true for fermions. Because when you expand, you always say that phi equals to what? Phi plus psi plus f. And when you and when you want to extract some of these fields around, you need to take derivative of k. So anyway, you will take two derivatives of k. So you will get a metric. However, it would not always be fourth derivative of a globally defined function. And this would be important when you will study cohomological properties of this action. Mm -hmm. By the way, when you make this computation, when you make this computation, you will get some structure like G i j bar d bar phi, sorry, d mu phi, d mu phi, phi bar, okay, phi j bar. Plus, you will have some terms uh, for fermions. However, you would definitely have some kind of connection. Okay. So you would see the structure like this. Psi bar psi, some connection, d phi. Because you assume that for uh, for things to go smoothly, you have derivative of psi. What would it be to take a derivative of psi when psi is clearly a section of the tangent bundle? Of course, you would assume that there is a connection. And of course, it, it has to be induced connection. So you assume that you'll have these structures. Also, if you have read something about supersymmetric sigma module, you would expect to get terms like so-called four fermionic term. So you may ask, with curvature, so you may ask, how do, how do they come from? It's interesting exercise that if you do this expansion, and then you try to eliminate the field F out of the business. You generate these terms. 
Why? It is because that when k is not quadratic, you have interesting terms coming out of this. You can have f bar coming from from phi phi bar, mm -hmm. and also you may have two fermions coming from phi. Each coming with theta. So, so this f bar is coming with theta bar squared. So you have this structure. And this is multiplied by the third derivative of k with respect to phi i, phi j, phi k bar. Okay? Interesting uh, term. You see how I get it? Third derivative of k. You, you may also have fourth derivative of k. You see, if you are a person from algebraic geometry, you would never like to hear about third derivative of k or fourth derivative of k. However, there is the fourth derivative of k. It is d four k, d phi i, d phi j, d phi bar k, d phi bar l, and you have what? And you have fermions, spinners, psi i, psi j. Psi bar k, psi bar l. You have this term. You have some term with a third derivative. And also you have this f, f bar term. Times the second derivative, okay? And then look, you need to exclude f out of the game. You may think that it is harmless. So before you, you thought that it's harmless. Now it's not that harmless. Excluding this field f provides you pro pro provides you various types of interactions. In particular. There are two ways to get four fermionic terms. This one, and from this Gaussian integral. Hmm? Pasha, is it clear? Yes. So you will have this structure, D3K, D3K, and here is the inverse matrix. Here you have, graphically speaking, psi to the fourth, and you have fourth derivative of k. And interesting, this is exactly the formula for the Riemann tensor for Keller metric. How else could you could you play? You can take some. You can also take some uh, thetas, I don't know, say from this phi. So what I just want to say is that you may check, you may see how you are getting this covariant derivative term. Hmm?
So, um, so sorry, very, very silly thing. So uh, I forgot how it works. So first derivatives of K, do they have a geometric meaning? Oh, first, first, first. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, I don't. So they do not have local geometric meaning. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, I don't know. Maybe they have first. Uh, maybe they have uh, geometric meaning because it's it's from the matrix. You see, mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know at the moment. But you see, the different is what's interesting is that you are getting differential geometry on Keller manifolds, not by uh, solving uh, some equations for uh, Levitivity connection and curvature. You are getting them this way. Mm -hmm. And this is interesting. So this is differential geometry. This is scalar differential geometry embedded in this super field language. Mm -hmm. So, so when it happened, people were a bit excited. But now there is another term. So uh, any choice of a function k gives us, uh, or I guess any choice of a Keller manifold uh, g gives us a what a supersymmetric at n equal to supersymmetric sigma model or what exactly. It is called n equals one, d equals four, Susie. Mm -hmm. Or it is called n equals two, d equals two, Susie. Actually, people say that it is n equals two comma two. So it's how you how you actually count them. Mm -hmm. So when you go several dimensions down. So, for the purposes of uh, harmonic analysis on the manifold, you need the lower d. For the purpose to construct the four-dimensional model, you need d equals four. Could you say it again? So, so, so everything depends on what you want to get. Mm -hmm. From the same construction, you can get either n equals one, d equals four supersymmetry. Mm -hmm. If you consider d equals four case, or if you go to d equal one case, you get complex Hodge theory. D equal one is what compact Hodge theory? What is it? Mm. Uh, not compact, complex, complex Hodge theory. Oh, you mean the target? Uh, yes. And it's interesting that you have these two things together. And by the way, we know that we need complex Hodge theory uh, in order to construct uh, solutions to WDVV equation. So it's also so it's also here. But uh, for instance, if if d equals two, then we are not uh, we are not told that it's anything nice like a conformal field theory, for instance. Ah, of course, of course, this this is super symmetric, but not conformal. Mm -hmm. So we know that to have a conformal field theory, we need like uh, Ricci flatness. Mm -hmm. And here we do not have Ricci flatness. We have some equation on K that K produces Ricci flat matter. Mm -hmm. but, what, but what would we get? Uh, you know, Pasha, now we go that smoothly, yes? That, mm -hmm. uh, that I cannot stand and uh, 
And I have to say a lot about supersymmetric models since we got into them. Okay. Because uh, this brings sigma model that's called nonlinear sigma model. Mm -hmm. Now we will describe superpotential, and later on, not today, we will describe uh, so called gauge, gauge linear sigma models, mm -hmm. and even gauge nonlinear sigma models. And you know why? Because here you will see the constructions of, uh, of Keller quotients. see the moment maps and all that okay so clear quotients as in symplectic reductions yes exactly mm -hmm. starting from supersymmetry mm -hmm. and this is actually related to the issue of mirror symmetry ah of two dimensional mirror symmetry of, of uh, I will meet its second form. So I'll come later to this. So we will get everything. You see, we will get everything uh, step by step. Mm -hmm. So at the moment, I said that in, in D equals form, you have this uh, super, super symmetry, and uh, it was actually exactly what people are looking for on the accelerators. Because, because people wanted the Higgs field to be the field of this type. You see, it's a minimal, it's, in some sense, it's a minimal super multiplet. You have a complex scalar field. And you have a fermion. So the fermion is two components. And the fermion uh, obeys the first order equation. So here we have scalar, and scalar obeys the second order equation. So scalar obeying second order equation is like fermion. Uh, that is a like two component fermion obeying the first order equation. You can so you can somehow count the number of degrees of freedom. But it but it is if you would like to have physical perspective on what is going on. Sorry, what do you mean that the fermion? What do you say fermion is, has two components? I mean, this is Dirac fermion it should have four. Um, ah. It's, it's, it's because uh, it's because that is because the phi is it's a wild so chiral field have uh, two oh, components and anti chiral field have two other components. Ah, psi oh, has two and psi bar has two other. Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. <clears throat> And moreover, Pasha, if we came already here, then later I'll explain uh, the twisting mm -hmm. that you can do here. We discuss the twisting in uh, two-dimensional sigma models. If we know this, we can study the four-dimensional twisting. OK, it, it will come out later. But now I want to consider another important term. And this another important term is the following. It is D2 theta. And here we have holomorphic function of phi. So this is simple. Here we have what? First of all, first of all, we have a holomorphic function. We have no k. So we can easily decompose it into what? We need to get to theta. So we can either get it 
from DW over D phi I F I because F has uh, two theters in it. Mm -hmm. Plus, how else could we get to how else could we get to theters? Take the derivative in theta one once to get psi and then another time the same thing. Exactly. And this is the second term. Mm -hmm. And then I just cross this. <coughs> Huh? So first, let us look at the bosonic term, because we know that the bosons dominate. Okay, in the old world, the bosons dominate, like man dominated. You know, so it's called bosonic domination. So in the old world, people just don't want to study four fermionic terms and. All this because they say everything is dominated by bosons, you know. On the later on, people start to, to say that uh, fermionic terms are much more interesting, they are subtle, they are interesting. Let's see this curvature, the tens and the four fermionic term would show up in different uh, index type computation. Okay, so all of this bosonic domination like this would be killed on the constant map however fermions it's important survive if you go to constant maps because they have no derivatives so it is very tricky interplay what is important what is not important so here we have this term and then, of course, we have another guy. So, would we have only this term? Okay, let us do it step by step. Suppose we have only this term. Plus F bar. What we will get when we integrate F field, this goes away. Okay. And we have so called on shell, only second derivative term. But this field, but this term is important. This second derivative term. What we get when we integrate the what we get when we integrate the so how so how how can we do the how are we doing this Gaussian integration? We do this Gaussian integration by shifting variables, yes? Mm -hmm. So, so we shift variables saying that now f bar is shifted, yes, mm -hmm. to f bar plus dw over d phi i with a metric. And it kills this poor term. However, this already has some kind of a consequence. And consequence is, is as follows. If we look at the action of the supersymmetry, supersymmetry was, so let us see how supersymmetry was acting. 
So the supersymmetry was taking phi into psi, and also supersymmetry was taking psi into what? Into two terms. F, that would be, I'm writing the general structure, plus d phi. So this is kind of the odd field that we have on the space of fields. It's a vector field, right? Mm -hmm. So proximity is a vector field on the space of fields. <clears throat> so when you have a odd field on the space of fields, it's important to see where it has zeros. Because uh, later we would like to have localization and all that stuff. So what is so what is interesting here? So so the zeros of the odd vector fields could be either derivatives of the bosonic field or f terms. So you may think that the zero locus, zero of q of supersymmetry are constant maps because of this. And uh, this crazy f equals zero things. However, what is interesting, when we shift F bar terms, you may see that this supersymmetry would hit here to dw over d phi. So we will have the zero locus as the critical points of w. One second. And we will come to this issue later. Because we will study this supersymmetric transformation. I am just giving you a hint how it comes out. That's already here we have critical, uh, critical points of W. But things are even more interesting if you if we have both terms w bar of phi bar because this term would bring f bar dw bar of a d phi i bar plus of course w bar two prime psi psi. Now, putting all together, putting all together, we will have Well, so that's what we have. Pasha? Yes. So you see, so, so these are bosonic pieces that we have that contained F. Even in the case, even in the case of if metric is less, so I put here plus O of derivatives of K. And if we integrate f out, f and f bar, 
we will get the beautiful result. And this beautiful result would be dw over d phi i, dw bar over d phi bar, g i j bar. And this is potential. So it is called potential made out of the super potential. So in the case of D equals four, it was a striking result. It said, that in order to have a supersymmetry, you need to have a potential for the scalar fields of the very special form, namely like this. So do, do we require that W and W bar are complex conjugate to each other? It's a good issue. If you, if you want some properties of the theory, like uh, the theory to be unitary, Hermitian, etc., Yes, you do. However, if you would like to look at the formal structures, the answer would be no, you do not. Formally, these could be very different. So, at least, at least it is clear that if you try to, if you would like to preserve supersymmetry, mm -hmm. you may change W and W bar separately. Uh, so, so, so this is just the, the bosonic part of the answer. There were also psi terms, right? Yes, there were, there were mm -hmm. also psi terms. Mm -hmm. So bosonic piece of the answer is like this. And you may look at, look at here and say, ah, if these are complex conjugated, we already sit at the critical point. Mm -hmm. Um, so in dimension two, is it the same as Landau Ginzburg? Of course. Mm -hmm. Of course. So when I go, so when I, when I study not dimension four, when I study, study dimension two, of course I get this. So this is what people called in dimension two Landau Ginzburg. In D equals two, it's called Landau Gilbert. In D equals one, it is called, it should be called the generalized Hodge theory. So it's interesting that supersymmetry allows you to go between dimensions with different interpretations. Let me tell you something in advance. From what I was explaining to you, from what I was explaining to you, for the mirror theory, in the mirror theory, in the Lagrangian, if you look at the space of maps, of holomorphic maps, you would have W bar equal to zero, but finite W. It's interesting. Moreover, when you have such a theory, you can play different games. You can construct currents. You can construct super algebra. You can construct everything. And you will do it in a second. Let me also tell you another peculiarity of this model, that in order to get this supersymmetry, 
You see, when we integrate out F, F bar fields, do you know what we are getting immediately? We are getting L infinity realization of the supersymmetry. You see, many things happen simultaneously. I am trying to describe it to you in detail. So when we are writing things in terms of the superfields, when we are writing things in terms of the superfields, it's a normal symmetry. But whenever we integrating something out, Pasha, you know what happens when we integrate something out? All integrals are BV integrals. And if we look at the supersymmetric theory this way, we will definitely get BV integration and, uh, and clear or uh, standard supersymmetry would turn out into the infinity supersymmetry. So, super, so when we integrate uh, these F fields out, we will have uh, so-called infinity supersymmetry or what is what was previously called supersymmetry realized on the uh, shell. Mm -hmm. So there will be by vector here. And it will be interesting. No, it's not interesting. You can find this by vector. So, so this is an important place where you need to look around and see what is going on. Potential. Exclusion of F fields by vector. So maybe maybe I'll stop here. Okay, Pasha, what about this? Because I don't want to go, I don't want to get you tired, and I kind of have a feeling that. Uh, Hmm. You see, I don't want to hurry up. Mm -hmm. Was it clear at the moment what's going on here? Uh, you see, from this place, I want to move in another direction, from this important place. So I told you about the chiral field, actually. Mm -hmm. Yes? Mm -hmm. But I have not told you I mentioned, but I haven't told you about uh, gauged chiral field theory. Hmm? Mm -hmm. And maybe now, when you spend your mental resources to put all the supersymmetry from your head, maybe now you would ask me what happens with the gauge uh, symmetries? Because when, whenever we have uh, some theory, we need to consider this gauged version. Mm -hmm. So I already told you that uh, kinetic term looks like, as you call potential, yes, as a mass term. Okay. Right. So let, let us see what could we expect about gauge symmetry. Mm -hmm. Because when, when we are talking about sigma models, we should always keep in mind that so-called nonlinear sigma model is only a particular case of the sigma model. The general sigma model is, of course, gauged sigma model. Mm -hmm. So let, well, so let us consider the simplest example. You will see how surprisingly simple the <coughs> gauge theory is in this language. Hmm? So now I'll spend some time about gauge theory. And I hope that you will find your favorite formulas here. So let me recall 
How did we get gauge theory in uh, uh, standard case? We write Dirac equation, okay? So this is the simplest thing, yes? Mm -hmm. And then what we do? We have a phase transformation. And we say that when we have a phase transformation, it could be compensated by what? We add here gauge field and we shift gauge field. Sorry, without bar. And we shift gauge field to the derivative of alpha, yes? So that's how we understand gauge fields in the simplest case, right? Mm -hmm. But now, as I told you, in this supersymmetric wall, the derivative is not the fundamental concept. It comes in expansion of the superfield. So you may ask, maybe the gauge theory is as simple as kinetic term is. Do you have such a conjecture? If you do, you are right. Because let me tell you what the what is the analog of this? So we have a chiral field. What can we do? We can go from phi to e to the i alpha phi. And this also has to be chiral, I mean alpha, right? Mm -hmm. So for the phi bar field, we have similar thing. And this has to be anti-chiral. So now, now you will get it, you will get it, because I know it, you don't. So I want to make you a pleasure of guessing. You see? So how should we compensate this uh, term? Hmm? This action is not invariant under these transformations, right? How do we know it? Because we know that, that it gives you Dirac fermions. So if I have here e to the i alpha bar e to the minus i alpha, how to compensate? Hmm? How would you compensate this? Of course, you see, if I do this, it is just, uh, I will get this gauge transformation of the Dirac fermion. How should I compensate this? Mm -hmm. So in supersymmetry, all answers are simpler than in ordinary symmetry. So the answer is uh, very stupid, but clear. There should be some kind of superversion of gauge fields uh, into, between phi bar and phi. Mm -hmm. Yes. So it means that we need to have here superversion of gauge field, but it, and, and it needs to compensate this. So how to write it down? Mm -hmm. No derivative. Well, what would you put here? It's interesting, since if you don't know, you could guess. I don't know. Okay, so, so, so let me tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. You put here 
this compensation factor. And what is this? Superfield. And what, what's that? a new, new superfield? Yes, it will be a superfield that would contain gauge field. I don't know yet what would it be, but I, but I need this field V to compensate this shift. Mm -hmm. So you see here, everything is abelian. So how can I compensate this shift? Variation of V should be what? Alpha minus alpha bar. <laughs> you see? Mm -hmm. If I multiply here, okay, I. Here I multiply, here I compensate, that's it. Mm -hmm. Well, that's it. This is a gauge theory. No, I, I don't know what it means. Uh, so I don't know what, what is V yet. What, 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 so what, what is it? What, what, so then, what V, what v should be? Mm -hmm. V should be a super field, of course. But I mean, what, what, what is it? We discussed at length what, what is fine, what is phi bar, so that they correspond to some particular representations. Ah. What is V? So, so this V. It's called, you see, it's called V, not because of the great physicist who is called V. It's, it's called V because it's vector. Mm -hmm. Okay. The simple answer is that V is just a general superfield without any constraints. Because you see, it, can, it shifts by both uh, chiral and anti chiral. So it couldn't be either chiral or anti chiral. Uh. Ah, so it's just a function of uh, x theta yeah, and theta yeah, bar. Yes. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So in this world of supersymmetry, simple solutions mm -hmm. go pretty well. Mm -hmm. And then what can we say about this V? So when you think about gauge theory, you assume some index like a mu, one form connection, I guess. Mm -hmm. And here there is no connection. So. Mm -hmm. So let us see what's going go. Idea is as follows. Let us expand this V. So we will have some V of X, a scalar plus Plus, we have we will have some something like uh, theta's, okay? Some theta dependence. Put here some theta alpha, and get some crazy fermion. We don't need them. But they are here. You see, they are here, but we don't need them. Interesting. Plus, at some moment, we get the structure theta alpha, theta bar, alpha bar. And then the product of the left spinners and the right spinners, we have several structures. And among them, here. Sorry, indices are all the way around. Huh? Plus other terms. You see what's going on? The field V has many terms and somewhere in the middle you have something that looks like connection. So connection is not the basic component. Connection is higher. And now let us check.
how everything is transforming when we use this alpha and alpha bar, okay? Note that now we have not the gauge theory, but super gauge theory, okay? So mm -hmm. super, super symmetry is acting everywhere. Hmm? So we, of course you know such structures in the IKZ model where we have differential forms. Here we have another version of it. So, so what is the parameter of the gauge transformation, alpha? Is a function of x theta theta bar, yes? So it has many components. It has the basic component. That is a scalar plus it has super components. Alpha one, alpha two. So what, so you may ask, what looks like gauge transformation in this super, super gadget? So it's actually, uh, alpha, zero. alpha zero looks like gauge. And what, and what would be the role of the rest? There are here, we cannot ignore that. So we have this huge symmetry mm -hmm. and we have this huge field. So what could be a scenario? Anti-field. <laughs> mm, no, it would not be anti-fields. It would be it would be auxiliary fields. So now let us see what is going on. Let us see uh, what happens. Uh, if we use only alpha of x, you may ask, is here, here we have alpha of x hat with a plus, and there is also, so we have this, this piece. And we have also alpha, that is alpha zero of x minus, all right? Pasha? Yes. And we have that difference. So let us forget all these higher theta terms. Let us see at the lowest level. So when we have alpha zero of x plus minus alpha zero of x minus, and this is delta v, we have other terms. So what do we have out of this? We have an interesting term here, x plus and x minus are not x's, of course. So alpha zero of, of x plus contains term alpha zero of x plus theta theta bar gamma dm alpha zero, right? And the same happens with alpha zero of x minus. With the sign minus. So if alpha zero with a hat is complex conjugated properly to alpha zero, then these terms go away. Hmm? And this is exactly the gauge invariance of the phi bar phi, okay? The invariant, if you pick here phases that are complex conjugated. So it is this consolation. However, here, there is an important minus sign. And that's why in, if I have consolation in the leading term, 
I have du duplication in the subleading term. And it is exactly the structure that I anticipate here. Now look. So I'm showing you the pieces of the picture, but I'm showing you the relevant pieces of the picture. Mm -hmm. So A have to be shifted by the derivative of alpha naught. And this is exactly the gate transformation. So people who uh, invented this were great guys, West and Zumina. One second. So they called it Verzumino. So this is Verzumino gauge theory. So it is actually very simple. So invariance of Lagrangian with respect to coarse transformations to symmetry is cancellation of these pieces. And the second term is the gauge field. So the moral, derivatives and supersymmetry come together. And that's how we can go, uh, that's how we can get the gauge field in. And of course, there should be generalizations. Let me take a Two minutes break, and that'll be right back. One minute break. So, so here I uh, here I try to show you how to do this, and of course you know how to generalize. Okay. So uh, uh, after after we get an idea how it works, of course you can generalize. Uh, you also need to write the young Mills term. First, let me show how to generalize, and then. Because uh, uh, I did it for a killer metric. So what, what you actually have is now you have this. And now you want, of course, what? You want to have a, a uh, symmetry. So this is kinetic term. So what is a symmetry? It's not you want rotation. It's a vector field acting on the space of fields. Right? So most probably you would like to write it in the following way. Vector field acting on the space of fields. The representation does not need to be linear. Okay, so that's why. Let me let me put it as an exercise. Exercise. Okay, X. And you see when I'm on the blackboard, I am misspelling English letters. How to generalize? It is doable. In the case, if a symmetry is V, vector field,
And you see, it's interesting that it that in order to preserve supersymmetry, this vector field should have tricky dependence on phi and phi bar. Not just uh, any symmetry would work, but only special symmetry would work. Only special vector fields would go. Okay. So it's one issue. Another issue is an issue that Pasha said. How can we get? How can we get uh, the young mills, right? So okay. So we have a vector field. It turns out. That in order, you see, it's interesting. How how would you even guess how to get a young means? Hmm? First, we need to look on what the curvature is, right? Hmm? Because this is connection. And how can we see a curvature? So, of course, we can see a curvature if we take a derivative of the connection. But how to write down it, not in terms of component, how to write it down in terms of the field? So, so connection is a plus. Some kind of covariance. Yeah, you see, but the connection that comes into covariant derivative, however, derivative is not a fundamental object. So the magic mm -hmm. of uh, supersymmetry is that derivative of a bosonic over coordinates is not a fundamental object. Mm -hmm. It is a derived object. Kinetic term is not a fundamental stuff. It's not a fundamental structure here. So the main thing that, that we wrote this thing has no derivatives at all. So, so there are several important issues. So let me uh, let me give you a hint. So, uh, from my understanding, what you need to do is to construct derivative of the vector field. And if you construct such derivative, you would get, you would get a curvature. So, 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 so if you would like to have a curvature squared, the best thing that we could write is like is a thing like this. And note that this. This field C 
seems to be, and it's interesting, that this field seems to be, you know what, chiral. And do you know why it is chiral? It is chiral because it has debar derivatives here. So it's actually d bar one v, d bar two v. So what would happen if I apply to this d bar one? So I think that after total derivative, uh, it will be zero. Okay. So so it's one thing. I, I still would like to mention another thing. So we will just, so I see, I, I think that people are interested in it. So how to get a kinetic term would be discussed. Kinetic term. I'll discuss it, of course. But I want to stress on another term. And this another term is the following. Just imagine that I have this structure and I have e to the v here. And of course I have d for theta. So let us ask, what could we get here besides the Dirac fermion coupling? We can get here on a very interesting term. You see this v has many terms. But also, it has a very important term that has four thetas, the maximum number of thetas. And, and uh, we already, I already told you that it's called the D term. Okay? So if I'll have this D sitting here, what would I get? This has many terms plus. So this D term soaks all four thetas, right? So I'll get here phi bar phi times D. And this D seem to be what? It seemed to be an auxiliary field that we need to integrate out like we integrated F term. And do you see what is phi bar phi, Pasha? You should know what is phi bar phi. Mm, it's a Yukawa term or something. No, Yukawa term is about fermions. I see. And so, of course, you know it, but it's a different context. So, in supersymmetry, you see the same structure that you have in other geometry, but in a different context. Let me tell you. So, of course, here, here, we have a, uh, a gauge coupling constant, right? So here I have E naught, the charge. So actually, I actually have, so I could have different fields and each of them have, have their charges. So, So what would you say about this structure? So if you still don't see it, let me consider this being non-abelian theory, okay? So in non-abelian theory, it is clear that what you should write would be matrix A mm -hmm. times the vector field V. Sorry. And the D term would look like TA. 
sorry. D A. Five bar. T A. Five. So this is this detail. Yeah. Then 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 it's B A A term. So. Mm -hmm. So, so these are Lagrange multipliers. And what is this? Five bar T phi. Mm -hmm. This is a moment map. Mm -hmm. Why? <laughs> this is the moment map. Squared in the fields. Moment map. Hmm. So, so, so this is actually, so this is actually the Hamiltonian that generates uh, linear transformation. Mm -hmm. I see. It is a moment map. That's why it's here in all dimensions. You see, it is a scalar. This scalar would uh, would be here forever in dimension four, in dimension two, in dimension one. It is a moment map. And here we have D times a moment map. It is a zero of what? It is a zero of momentum. Mm -hmm. That you get in Keller reduction. So <laughs> you see, so when I write it in supersymmetry, it's not clear that these structures are here. Of course, you know them, but you, but you were not expected to see them in supersymmetry. But here they are, and that's why people were so excited about supersymmetry, like uh, forty years ago, when they started to see that many structures of differential geometry, symplectic geometry, appear in these supersymmetric constructions. And this is this uh, so-called magic of supersymmetry. That when you start to work with supersymmetry, you immediately touch other uh, sides of the semantics, of mathematical physics. OK. So, still, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it, it always happens with me like this. Okay, when I wanted, I, when I want to discuss one thing, I'm discussing another thing. But, uh, Pasha, would you be tomorrow? Is there mm -hmm. a chance? Uh, tomorrow, Thursday. I'm, I'm not sure. So let me. Uh, well, either tomorrow or, or Friday. Maybe on Friday, or did you, did you plan to continue this? Uh, you see, Friday? you see, if I invoked all this, you see? Yes, yes. The use, of, the use of this is that when we start to discuss it, we need to discuss it a bit. Yes. Because uh, you would like to know, uh, you'd like to know where, where are these gauge, uh, Kinetic terms are, <coughs> and how, and how these kinetic terms uh, fit in, into the supersymmetric qualification. Why they are actually F terms, and why they are relatives to superpotential, and how this is, and how this would be related to uh, four-dimensional mirror symmetry. So, oh, Andrei, I. I, I Okay, I will try to, to come uh, tomorrow. Okay. Sorry? Okay. Yeah, my, my, my problem is that, you know, uh, these things, they create sort of the jet, jet lag effect for me. Yes, so, uh, but, uh, okay. The, okay, right. so let, us, let us do the following. La, 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 let me postpone this gauge. Uh, no, 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 I, I'll, come, I'll come on Thursday. I'll come for Thursday seminar. Okay, so, okay. So the plan on Thursday would be 
now, now, now they come like this. Structure from other fields of physics and mathematics inside supersymmetrical theories, okay? Um, right, 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 right. So what you are writing is is what is called the, the gauge linear signal model, right? Or like, I I, guess... I'm going towards it. Sorry? Yes, yes, so this, this would be gauge linear signal model. Okay. These, these formulas led finally to the formula of Keller and hyper-Keller reduction. So when you integrate out this field, you use a Keller metric. And that's why uh, I, I forget whom, Hitchin, uh, was always uh, showed a lot of respect to people who are doing supersymmetry because, because uh, the Keller reduction and hyper-Keller reduction formulas were first, uh, firstly derived by physicists, I think by Martin Rocher. Mm -hmm. And then mathematicians said, oh, we knew that. Mm -hmm. That's how you get explicit kinematric on the on the closed space on the cosets. All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. But I'd like to add here another thing for the maximum mirror symmetry and then an analogy between superpotential and uh, kinetic term for. Uh, for uh, connection. These are relatives too. And this is kind of a clue to uh, the four dimensional mirror symmetry that is not established yet. Okay? Mm -hmm. so, so let us discuss this. Okay? All right. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh -huh.